So one of my favorite things to get from the duck, which is the university cafeteria, is the pot sticker. And I would go two, four times a week, and I get one, five orders at a time. And I would go week after week after week until I had this revelation that what I was eating this entire time, those weren't pot stickers. Uh, These are pot stickers. Pot stickers are generally made with thicker dumpling wrappers. They're left open at both ends, and they're pan fried by slowly adding in dabs of water. What they serve in the duck, as far as I could tell, actually a form of steamed dumplings. And this is not to be confused with soup dumplings. Soup dumplings are a delicacy from Shanghai, uh, which are also not to be confused hmm, with boiled dumplings. Boiled dumplings are the traditional form of dumplings served in northern China. Uh, and pot stickers are also not the same as pan fried dumplings. Pan fried dumplings are generally boiled first and then pan fried, which are also not the same as gyozas. These are Japanese, and I have no idea how they make them, so don't ask me anything about it. Um, why am I saying all of this? Well, it's crazy to me how a university as large and as diverse as WashU could make such a simple mistake in mislabeling dumplings as pot stickers. But I feel that this is really a reflection upon American culture as a whole, specifically American food culture. Now, I'm not claiming to be an expert on American culture or Chinese culture for that matter, nor am I claiming to be an expert on food. I am, however, a self-proclaimed expert in the realm of awkward cultural interactions that stem from the two sides of my cultural identity. One of my favorite, favorite memories was a couple years ago, I was in summer school, and an American classmate had come up to me and asked me whether people in China still smoked opium. They don't, in case anyone here is wondering. But I was born in the States to American-educated Chinese parents, and I moved to China when I was two months old. Uh, that's where I've lived ever since until I came to WashU. Now, despite being an American by label, uh, I still experienced major forms of culture shock when I first came to WashU. I was confronted with all of these existential questions, you know, like, who is General Tso? <laughs> what kind of flavor is orange chicken? And who actually eats fortune cookies? But I realized that the source of my culture shock mm, comes from this huge disparity between how Chinese culture and American culture approaches food. See, to the Chinese people, food is a lot more than just what they eat. It's also what it's supposed to represent. A dumpling uh, is generally eaten during Chinese New Year's uh, to celebrate family. Now, my family always sit around at a table and make dumplings together, and my mom will always tell me the story about how the filling of a dumpling is supposed to represent family, that when you wrap it together, it's supposed to represent unity. Now, that's the kind of symbolism I would expect from a high schooler in their English essay, but for some reason, that story stuck. And every time I would eat a dumpling, that's the first thing I think about is its history and culture and why we eat it. In contrast, I don't really see there to be such an attitude in the States, where food is really eaten for its aesthetic and taste appeals, as well as probably how, well, how good it's going to look on Instagram later. Now, mm, I myself am a victim of this phenomenon. So you can see these are just some of the many photos I've taken over the past year on my Instagram. And yes, I do like all of my photos, disclaimer. But as a result, Americans are not particularly attuned to the history and cultural meanings behind the food they, foods they eat. I like to refer to this phenomenon as blind eating, uh, where it refers to a general attitude of indifference towards the history and culture of the food that people are eating. This became especially apparent to me whenever I went to get Chinese food with my friends. But what's wrong with this culture of blind eating? Well, Blinding eating is really a reflection upon the notion that American culture is a melting pot. In a melting pot, smaller cultures come together and blend it and assimilate it into a greater one. But over the past few decades, there has actually been a significant shift away from this thinking as a melting pot uh, towards this notion as multiculturalism, or the symbolism of a salad bowl. Hmm. In a salad bowl, the ingredients are so obviously distinct and separate, but yet together they each add unique in flavors and textures to the dish as a whole. 
Now, despite this overabundance of food metaphors in American culture, this practice has not really trans been translated into food, where the meaning and history behind the food that people eat are still oblivious to most. But on a broader scale, blind eating perpetuates this attitude where it's okay not to know the culture of the food that you're eating because they're just going to assimilate. And furthermore, blind eating permeates through our daily interactions with our friends, families, and strangers, and really bars us from becoming a truly multicultural society. After all, how can we be a multicultural society if we don't even make an effort to get to know the other cultures? But I think there's a solution to this problem. I think there's three components that need to be addressed together. Food, restaurants, and consumers. Now, food. Food itself has to be authentic. We must make sure that the food we serve and the food that we eat is authentic. After all, how can you have cultural and historical meaning behind the food if itself is Americanized? One of my favorite places to eat at in New York City is Xi'an Famous Foods. Coincidentally, Xi'an Famous Foods is started by a Washu alum from 2008, and they serve cuisine from the Xi'an region of China that is so unapologetically Chinese that I myself have trouble eating it sometimes because of how spicy it is. But despite this claim to authenticity, this model works, and they are exceedingly popular with over 11 locations across the five boroughs of New York City. But restaurants have to do a lot more than just serve authentic food. They also have to aim to tell a story with the food that they're serving. One of my favorite places to eat at in St. Louis is Lona's Little Eats. Uh, Lonus Little Eats is based in Soulard, and the first thing you'll notice when you walk in are the newspaper clippings and the photos on the wall that really showcase the story of Lonus as a chef, as well as the culture of the food that she's serving. So when you bite into that giant rice paper wrap that Lonus is famous for, you're not really just tasting the food. You're also tasting the history and the culture behind it as well. But we, as customers, also have to do a lot more than just eat the food. We have to make sure that we recognize there's a his history and culture behind everything that we eat. And we have to actively seek out such cultural and historical experiences at places like Xi'an Famous Foods or Lona's Little Eats. Now, I'm by no means saying that we should boycott places like Panda Express. But Chinese American food is a unique case where one of the three components, that is the food, has become so westernized that it's almost unrecognizable in mainland China. But just because one of the three components is broken doesn't mean that we, as consumers and the restaurant owners, have an excuse to engage in blind eating. We simply have to recognize that there is a different set of history and culture behind Chinese American food. And we should aim to listen to that story and tell it. And to me, that story is a tale of survival. The Chinese, Americans, Chinese immigrants first came to the United States during the mid-1800s to help build the first transcontinental railroad. The Chinese American history is not a pretty one. They were discriminated against, shunned for a variety of reasons. There was even the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 that prohibited the immigration of Chinese laborers for over 20 years. One of the few successful instances in American history where a specific demographic of people were targeted for immigration purposes. Now, times were tough. Chinese Americans had to survive. They needed a source of income. So in a flash of genius, they came up with two ways that could better make their food appeal to American palates. They added a lot of sugar, and then they deep fried it. <laughs> really the recipe to a success in modern uh, American culinary scene. But the tragic story behind this is that Chinese people and Chinese uh, food had to shed most of its cultural identity in order to ensure that a small piece of its culture could still be preserved in American society. So as a result, when people eat Chinese American food today, they don't really focus on the cultural aspect of the food, and rather they're really drawn to it for its taste. But that doesn't mean that we have an excuse to engage in blind eating. We simply have to recognize that they have the story to tell, and they have historical and cultural significance behind it. We have to cherish it for its cultural and historical significance as a testament to the suffering and hardship of the Chinese people in America. People often say that food is the key to someone's heart, and this is especially true in my case, in case anyone's interested. Um, <laughs> food is arguably one of the most important things that we do besides breathing and sleeping. To become a truly multicultural society, 
to become a salable, we have to start with food. And we, as consumers, as restaurant owners, and as the food itself, have to shift our mindset from thinking that food is just sustenance to this new mode of thinking where food is a cultural artifact, that it is an agglomeration of another people, of another history, of another tradition, and of another people's suffering and prosperity. A dumpling has traveled through 2,200 years of history, has seen the rise and fall of countless dynasties and the births and deaths of many emperors, has traveled through great land masses and oceans, has gone through decades and decades and decades worth of transformation to finally get to the plate in front of you, in front of us. The least that we could do is to not call it a pot sticker. <laughs> Thank you.